So, you know, the team of Leslie and, and Mike and Betsy is, you know, just extraordinary. It's, I'm honored to be here uh, for them, but even more so for you, and, uh, and I'm humbled. You know, it's a very, maybe the most difficult talk I have all year because I, um, I wonder what I could possibly say to you because you guys are coming here for so far and your circumstances are challenging and different and you have uh, different things you're thinking about, although we may have a common goal of improving the human condition and promoting health and trying to help people and thinking of what our unique contribution can be that way, uh, the worlds are so distinct. And so it's with humility that I come to you and want to share some ideas with you, but recognize uh, that we're in a different place and that you know a world that's very different from my world, your experience is very different from my experience, and I would never pretend to tell you what you need to do, but maybe through common shared understanding, we can learn from each other and have ideas about how we can do our work better in each place where we work. And uh, uh, for one thing, I mean, for you to come to the North American continent when you've got the World Cup, well, that shows great d dedication to your work. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, extraordinarily impressed by that. And uh, so I just want to uh, start by making sure I see the group. So wh who's from Ethiopia? Wow, great group. And uh, from Ghana? Yeah, that's great. And Liberia? Wow, yeah. And Rwanda? Yeah. You know, I, that really gets me. You know that you guys are coming and you're such strong and uh, in big groups, I, I think it's really uh, uh, wonderful and amazing. And uh, I wanted to tell you one other thing, which was I, I'm so we're supposed to be speaking about measurement uh, today. And uh, you may know that you fill out evaluation forms. You know, we actually measure ourselves, but you measure us, you know. And, and I gave a talk last year. They were too kind to me. I mean, my talk was OK. It was uh, OK. And you say, how do you know it was OK? Well, because I looked at the grades that I was given. And uh, it was good. but. It was actually very good, but it wasn't as good as Betsy's grades. <laughs> and um, so, won't forget that. I, I, maybe she wasn't going to invite me back because of my grades. I don't know, but but I begged her. I said, I want one more chance to do better. <laughs> so, um, but I paid attention to the to the measurement. I mean, it it, it meant something to me. I understand that. Uh, Different people are giving different topics on different days. And of course, I know that Wednesday morning is probably going to get the lowest score because it's <laughs> in the middle. you are biased in it's, yeah. it's, in the, it's, in the, it's in the middle of the week. It's probably the most difficult spot in the entire schedule. So I understand that you know I've been given this spot on purpose. <laughs> and that's one of the challenges of measurement, is being fair when the person's giving it. On Wednesday morning. So when you're reflecting on the range of talks that you've heard, you not only think that I enjoy the talk, but where was it positioned exactly? And was it really, uh, did that person have the full opportunity to shine and to, to do well? So, the, um, the, so th there's a lot of complexity and measurement and subjectivity. And um, by the way, you're a very handsome man. I want to tell you that right now. <laughs> So, you know, how you feel about the speaker may reflect, all of you are actually, it's a, and dressed so well today, it's, it's a, it may reflect on your interpretation because we measure things sometimes with high subjectivity and sometimes we try to be objective, but the truth is there is no pure, there is no pure objectivity. Uh, and so we, we have to take these things into account when we are thinking about measurement and so I begged Betsy to give me one more, uh, one more chance to, uh, to at least tie her this year. So. But I don't want you to think of any of this when you're filling out the evaluation. I, don't, I want you to forget completely my plea to you. <laughs> and uh, I know this is the lowest of low to, be, to resort to this. But anyway, with that, thank you very much. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I heard short is also favored. <laughs> that if you, if you don't keep people and talk too long, they, they like that. So that's part of gaming, you know, you realize that there's ways to make yourself look better and so forth. 
Well, uh, another piece um, to get into about measurement. I, what I wanted to do is just share with you some ideas. And we've been working uh, in quality improvement for a long time. I would never say I've been working in measurement for a long time. Measurement is a tool. It's part of uh, your, your box <laughs> of things that you're using, your tools, to help you achieve a, a final goal. And it's not in and of itself uh, the thing that you care about. What you care about is improving the human condition, about helping uh, others, and figuring out how best to do that. But it, it's closely related to this idea about quality and quality improvement. And I just want to tell you a little bit about an insight I have, and, and at least reflect to you some of the challenges that we've had in this country. When I, we start talking about quality and process and organization, because it's so tightly connected with measurement. You can't embark just on measurement unless people feel that they understand where it fits and they, they are convinced that we need to be able to track what we're doing in order to get somewhere, that it begins, it's part of our toolbox, part of what we're using to get somewhere. And in this country, at least, uh, I'm trained as a physician. I am a physician. I'm a clinical physician. I was taught in the tradition of physicians to think about one patient at a time and to go deeply into that patient's need and to respond to their problems and to try to fix what that individual has. I wasn't taught to think about populations. I wasn't taught to think about systems. I was taught about what to do. There wasn't a lot of emphasis on how to do it exactly. I mean, of course, you're taught how to do procedures and so forth. But the way that you may be set up to run a clinic or to ensure that people are getting the right medications or they're taking the medications or you're diagnosing things correctly. I mean, the how piece, that accountability piece, wasn't part of my education. And when I began to realize that there were opportunities to save many more lives than the person in front of you, and it always remains a great privilege to take care of the person in front of you, but when I began to realize the power and potential to have an impact far beyond what the person was in front of you, I realized how ill-equipped, how poorly positioned my colleagues were to begin to think that way. Now, I'm not saying, OK, if I was smarter or more advanced, but I was exposed to certain ideas early in my career that made me think that there were ways to enhance the performance, to get more out of the effort that's being made than we currently are getting. To, to, to yield as if it's a field and you're harvesting. You know, we can get more bushels out of that field if we are smart about the way we plant and, and fertilize and harvest than if we basically just tell a bunch of people what to do and we send them out and we assume everyone's doing fantastic. If we start really beginning to count the bushels coming out of that field, we can recognize that that farmer is doing better than that farmer and that there are different ways that can potentiate the yield, the, the success. And we can do a, a lot better, begin thinking like this. And as I began talking to my colleagues, they thought I was from another planet. <laughs> they didn't quite get the connection. Because people would say to me things like, you don't understand. We are so busy. We do not have time for this. People either are dying, or people are sick, or we're understaffed. We have got too much going on here. At the end of the day, I don't go home till 9. I mean, I have no time in my day. You want me to meet about this? You want to have uh, us to devote time, not towards actually caring for the people, the long line out the door, but you want us to care? You want us to take time away from our day? I mean, we don't even get through everything we need to do by the end of the day. So there's a strong mentality that there is no time for this, because we have people standing out the door who have immediate needs that we have to tend to. And that was throughout all areas of medicine, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're an internist, whether you're a pediatrician. I mean, in this country, like your country, people in healthcare are working hard. They're working hard. I mean, I, it's not a place where lazy people go for vacation. <laughs> it's, it's, you are, they are breaking a sweat every day. And I'm amazed, uh, it, no matter what country you go to, the dedication and the, the the effort that's put in by your average person. Of course, we all have, no, there's maybe a few people somehow 
they're not devoting themselves quite the same. But in general, in general, people are working quite hard. And they're used to, you know, this shovel and then the next shovel. I mean, they are just each task in front of them. I mean, they're trying to move this, this mound of dirt to this side of the room. I mean, they're just, they don't have time. I mean, they're in the task that they're doing at the moment. And I began thinking about what's the metaphor for this? You know, how, how can I communicate well about this issue? Because if you don't buy into the idea that there are better ways of doing things, that you can get more bushels from the field, that, and to do so, we have to take a step back and actually invest our time, our effort, our dollars in improving our, our systems. If you can't buy into that, then the measurement is useless. I mean, what it, no one's going to pay attention to it. No one's going to act on it. People are going to find ways to undermine it. They'll use it for political purposes. It won't be real. The real is it fits into a construct that people understand that's fundamentally part of a mission to improve care and get more bushels out of each field. To say we can do that with the resources we have. We always want more resources. But we can make better use of the resources. We can get them to work for us better. And I'm just telling you, in this country, I mean, you, you may think, well, you've got a lot of resources. Well, we do. But we waste a lot more than anyone, too. And you don't see us getting more bushels than people spending less. There are many countries spending much less than we are that are getting the same bushels out of the field that we are. And so you have to ask the question, is it waste, or is it inefficient, or what is going on? What can we do? How can we be smart? And uh, so the, the metaphors. I've been thinking about, you know, these, these, these guys. They go out on a boat. And you know, actually, there are three boats. So I'll tell you a story of three boats. The boat goes out on the water. and. They're far from shore. And all of a sudden, they recognize that the boat's leaking. And you've got five, five friends who are together on the boat. And so they're smart. They know. They brought buckets with them. And they see that there's a leak. And uh, they start emptying the boat. Now, there's two problems. One is there's a reason the boat's filling with water. And, but they don't have time to think about that. They have to empty the boat. They're worried. The boat's filling. They can't think about it. Second thing is, there are holes in the buckets. They're not big holes. It's not a complete hole in the bottom so that every time you pull out a water, the whole thing goes through. It's a medium-sized hole. So every time you pick up with the water, <coughs> some of that water, maybe half of that water, falls back into the boat. And the five of them have to work so hard and so fast to keep the boat from sinking. And one of them says to the other, well, maybe we should you know, look at the buckets or look at the leak. And the others all say, we don't have time. We don't have time. We've got to continue to empty the boat. And so the, the five friends in that boat are in a what we would say a predicament. They're in a big predicament. What do they do? They cannot convince themselves that they have the luxury of time or resources to do anything else but what they're doing. And all they can do is stay even, which is falling just a little bit until they sink. They're not sunk, but they're close. And the water keeps coming in. And they keep emptying. And they keep doing it, losing half the water. And they can't think beyond that. That's the one boat. There's another boat. Different set of five friends. They go out. They go far from shore. The boat starts leaking. They're smart, too. They've got buckets. They got the same buckets. They bought it from the same guy. <laughs> it's got a hole. They were cheap, though. <laughs> they were inexpensive. But they didn't have a lot of money. They start emptying the boat. Now, this is a bunch of quality improvement people. <laughs> They're smart, five of them. They say, you know, we got a problem. We got a boat filling. There's a hole somewhere. We have 
We have buckets. They have holes. Very smart. They bend to this course. They say, we're inefficient. We're not doing what we could be doing. We could be doing better. They, they all agree. They said, we have to have a meeting about this. They meet. Boat fills with water. <laughs> they assign four of them to measure the one to see how well he's doing the emptying. <laughs> They carefully calculate how much is being lost from each bucket. They're measuring carefully how fast the, boat, the water in the boat is rising. The one wants to make sure the other is measuring it right. So one of them is just assigned to the other measurer to be sure that the measurer is doing it correctly. He's auditing the measure, wants to be sure. And the boat continues to sink until it sinks, <laughs> right? Because then you've got a third boat. The third boat, you can guess now, right? The same, different five guys. I don't know. It's this group of people. They're not thinking. But they go out. They've got a boat. It begins to leak. They've got the buckets. They, they continue to work to empty, but they're talking. They re recognize how much time have we got. They're balancing the need to continue to empty the boat with the recognition that they can be more efficient. They find ways to, while they're still emptying the boat, to work together to use some of their time to fix the bucket, and then use some of their time to find the hole, to at least make the hole in the boat smaller, if not get rid of the hole. And, but they do it in parallel, right? So they don't ignore it and say, we don't have time for this, because then all they're doing is emptying the boat until their arms fall off with, with pain, and the boat will sink. Eventually, it will in the first case. In the second case, they don't put too much resources toward the measurement. A ridiculous, out of proportion effort on measurement that has no hope of true success because now you've taken all this valuable thing in the boat it keeps filling now because you're now not attending to the threat that's right outside your door and you're not providing the service that needs to be done. But they're balancing. They're recognizing the way out of this predicament is to continue to empty the boat while at the same time spending your attention to make sure you're doing it better and recognizing what the underlying cause may be. So you're trying to slow the, the water into the boat as while at the same time the water that's already in the boat is being more effectively, more efficiently taken out of the boat. So it's this kind of metaphor, it's this kind of thinking that we need to, I believe, do to convince our colleagues about what we're talking about. Because if they feel that we're talking about just measurement for measurement's sake, it doesn't matter what we do. The measurement will not help us. If, if they feel that we're ignoring the need, because in the third case, there still is water coming in the boat. I mean, you have to get that water out of the boat. We have people who are already sick. They have to be attended to. We can't take time out and let that continue to rise without addressing it. So this is the balance. These are the issues within, within it that are so, I believe, important. And we have in our country uh, a lot of efforts around measurement that are nonsensical, that all they do is add burden. They provide no return. They provide no comfort that the effort that's been invested is going to ultimately improve any single person's life. And when people look bad and they start to look good, everyone's convinced it's only us a matter of making sure we write something down. You know, it's not changing actually anything. That's, that's unfortunate. It undermines all of our efforts at quality. It, reduces people's confidence that any of these tools can be beneficial, and especially when it's imposed from above with measures that are inadequate and difficult. It doesn't do any service for anyone. And that is a very common, because people often find comfort in numbers, or the idea of numbers, or a false idea that this is going to be beneficial. But we also have had experiences in this country where focused, 
well-grounded, scientifically rigorous measurement has provided a multiplicity, many benefits, including it has garnered clinical attention. It has gotten healthcare professionals to recognize that there's an issue where they never saw one before. Without the measurement, there was an issue that was invisible, now comes into view. It has gotten political support, such that we were able to get resources and direction and to begin to galvanize uh, investment to try to improve while we're still emptying the boat, while we're still emptying the boat, but, but that we're getting people to make that kind of investment. It brings about strategic attention where people can begin to realize that in a systematic way we have a problem that needs to be solved and need to develop a clear plan that is both feasible and likely to be effective. And it provides a, a means of accountability for what it is we're trying to accomplish. And I know you're getting pressure from that in many, from many sectors about accountability, accountability. But I do believe that in the end of the day, we're going to need to say, what results have we achieved? And it's not going to be enough to say, trust me, this was a good program. Trust me, we, it made sense. It was sensible. It was, it, it, of course we must have had a good benefit, because look at what we've done. We have all these people out doing all this activity. And people more and more are going to be asking about, I, I call it results-based accountability. It's like accountability on results, on what exactly happened. And more and more, it's shifting not only toward, <clears throat> for example, in the US, not just what you've done to a blood pressure or cholesterol measure. I mean, we're dealing a lot with chronic disease. But how many lives are saved? How many lives are improved? What can we say about that? What has the population actually experienced? And how, are, are, are there tangible benefits that we can point to that tell us that this program has mattered. Now, that's not so simple. Many, many of our initiatives have a lot to do with a wide variety of issues, including some cases, social justice, distribu distribution of resources, providing access, allowing people to get jobs and food as well as health care. I mean, it's a, it's a complex web of trying to improve the human condition. And we can often, our handicapped to try to understand how one aspect in health is moving people's condition. But still, there, we need to continue to hold ourselves to say, it, what evidence do we have that people's lives have been enhanced, that we are doing better, that we're getting more bushels from that field, that people are getting the benefit. So this is the way we're thinking about it. In, in the example that we've done most recently here, in some of the work that we've done with the government is we were able to steer the government to think about a problem that we have, which is that people who leave the hospital are often coming back quickly to need to be readmitted. When I was in medical school, no one talked about this problem. When I was in fellowship, no one mentioned it. When I, I was actually taught that <clears throat> there's a, we have a little like, you know, we're so happy when someone leaves the hospital. Uh, two reasons. They're leaving the hospital, that's good for them. They're leaving the hospital, that's good for me. <laughs> you know, that they, they are off my, off my responsibility. That was a big mistake, by the way. That culture that we were taught to like, OK, great, bye bye, good, good luck. <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm sure you don't have that in Africa, but in here, we, it was very much, there's the door, thank you, you know. Uh, and I hope everything turns out well. You know, it's a, it's a mentality that led to us having one in four patients coming back to need to be admitted to the hospital within one month, within one month. I don't know if you know this about our country, but in heart failure, for example, one in four, many conditions, one in five. That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, we would never even say that to a patient. You're going home, by the way, I'm going to see you again, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, it, 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 it was happening, but because we weren't systematically evaluating this particular issue, I don't think any doctor in America would have told you that number. They might have said maybe 10%. Maybe they would have said 5%. Nobody, because I don't know why, we're sort of filtering it out. You know? And also, we are in teams. And 
Sometimes if someone comes back in, I mean, you might walk down the hall and say, oh, right, hey, hi, nice to see you again. I didn't even know you were here. You know, someone else is taking care of them, which is another problem with our system, the lack of continuity or communication. But, but by beginning to measure it, we begin to recognize that we have a problem, a problem in the transition from people being in the hospital to being out of the hospital, in the communication of information about what happened in the hospital, in making sure they get an appointment outside the hospital, in ensuring they could afford the medications that we're prescribing for them out of the hospital, in making sure we're not getting them out too soon as we're trying to clear beds for the next person. Because it, think about this. It's like being in the boat then, right? I'm pushing you out because I need the bed. But then you come back in a month, which is filling, making my beds too, too full. <laughs> I'm, uh, by pushing people out too soon, I'm creating part of the crisis because they're adding to the demand for beds when they come back. Instead of maybe keeping them one more day and avoiding ne having them need to come back for four more days. So it, at the best, I might just be even by doing that. And so th this led us to start studying it, to start talking about it, and then we were able to get the government to say, you know, we're going to measure it for all hospitals. And we were fortunate our group was able to develop this measure that is now publicly reported on the web. Every hospital in America, for three conditions, has their readmission rate. What percent of their patients for, those, for heart failure, heart attacks, and pneumonia are needing to come back to the hospital within 30 days? And then, when we were going to have a change in the health care law, we were able to get some incentives actually put into the law. Now, I'm actually, we could spend a long time talking about it. In the end, it wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> but it, it's OK, uh, because it, it's probably going to be modified over time. But it gets people to put attention to this problem, because other than that, the hospitals had no reason. They actually made money both times. They made money on the first admission. They make money on the second admission. There was no reason for them. In fact, if they reduce readmissions, they reduce revenue. I know this sounds awful. It doesn't mean they were promoting readmissions. <laughs> but they certainly weren't interested in spending a lot of money to reduce them either. The government, by saying we're going to start paying attention and payments are going to be related to your readmission rate, now you've got attention. Now you've got the ability for people to say, we're going to invest in this now. Now we have to support those investments. We have to understand what makes the difference. How can we do that? And same for mortality. We have the same three measures for mortality, too. And we see a lot of variation. We see different hospitals being able to get different bushels out of the field. Different hospitals achieving different levels of performance. Some hospitals having low mortality rates. Some hospitals having high mortality rates. In my view, my view, we can begin to understand the hospital as risk factor. Some enhancing outcomes, some diminishing. If you look at the ends of the spectrum, going to a hospital with a higher mortality rate is like going with another risk factor. Like in a heart attack, having heart failure or not having heart failure compared to a lower hospital. You get what I mean by that? I mean, it's like we've been thinking, OK, you come in with a heart attack, and what's your heart rate, and what's your blood pressure, and do you have heart failure? We think about these things as contributing to your risk profile. And I'm suggesting that there's one more thing. Which hospital did you go to? Because that can increase your risk 30% or decrease it 30% in this country. And this is the challenge we have, now getting people to think, wow, admitted to my hospital? Does that enhance the chance that they're going to survive or be able to go home and not have to come back? Or does it increase the risk, the environment, as a risk factor? the organizational structure of the hospital as risk factor or, or <laughs> as beneficial intervention treatment, right? It's something we can do about it. The idea that we can measure in targeted ways with scientifically rigorous metrics that we can trust puts us in a position to do quite a lot of good. Poor measurement, poorly distributed, uh, not well thought out, Inappropriate distribution of resources on the measurement, given what the needs are, can put us behind. And so in the end, it's going to be up to us to chart this course, 
Measurement is neither good nor bad in its own right. It's a tool that can be used to great utility in the proper context if people understand and buy into the idea that the performance of the system matters and that we can use the measure to our purpose for enhancing performance, organizing interventions, holding ourselves accountable for what we achieve, and building on it for the next thing. And you, it, it really is a, a, a means by which we can, we can move forward. We can move forward. So I, I, um, uh, I know we were going to end it at 9.30. I wanted to have some time for discussion. But what, the most important thing I wanted to convey was how it fits. You know, we can, we can teach a lot about the details about measurement. It's hard to do it in a half hour or 20 minutes. But the conceptual piece is, I think, the starting point. Because we can give you the skills and provide you the help and support. And we can learn from you about how you're doing things. Uh, but, but we have to be in common understanding of ideas. And what I've shared with you, I believe, I mean, I'm telling you what my experience is here. But I believe it may be relevant to what you're encountering, too. Uh, because there's a certain universal piece to this, I think, that that matters across all systems and, uh, and, and within the culture of health, medicine and health. But uh, I don't know if you want to take questions or we should just end because we have a break. But I want to thank you very much for your attention.